Good afternoon. What I would like to do is present to you a research project that uh, is going into its uh, second year. And I'd like to discuss these four areas with the emphasis that when we first started this project, there were several things that we had to come to a decision on, as in what do we really mean by mobile learning? Because when we first started the project, we had several groups who wanted to provide us three and four month long e-learning courses and they wanted us to put it on the mobile app with all the uh, links and everything like that. And so that doesn't really work. So what we come to the conclusion of an agreement by the team was that when you talk about mobile learning, you're talking about that just in time training, you're talking about the refresher training so that you allow the individual to benefit from the blending learning exercise as well as gain something from the experience. And so that was kind of the definition that we used when we first started it. Also, in developing the program, it was a need to understand what is the fit for purpose that we wanted. And so in developing this concept, the first thing we did is we divided our, our applets into like scenarios into like three different meanings. One was getting ready to go on a trip. The second one was when you're flying in the air. And the third one is, what is the type of information that you need when you're on the ground? So the project itself is a $15 million project that is involving 24 nations plus representatives from NATO. And it was a two-year project with the testing and evaluation looking at the use of mobile technology as a training medium. Now, a lot of corporate corporate world and corporations, they already have mobile learning as part of their mechanism for learning. However, from the defense sector and the government, there's not a lot of mobile learning that's seen as being the, the, the state of the art or the thing to do. So the purpose of this research effort, this two-year effort, was to develop a sustained capability and to find out if mobile devices and mobile technologies actually do provide a good tra training medium. And the other thing is that we wanted to, so we're leveraging a learning management system that, that is in uh, Suffolk, Virginia, in the United States. And at the same time, we're emerging that with mobile technologies. And of course, since we started this project in the last two years, there's been so many drastic changes in mobile technology. And I imagine by the time we get ready at the end of this year to make it a full capability, there's gonna be more significant and transformational changes in uh, technology. So what were we really trying to get to? Well, when you're working on a project such as this, the US government likes to use what they call as dual use technology. So what we're trying to find is what in the corporate world is already at a readiness level where it's tried and tested. So in this case, mobile phones. Mobile phones are used in everyday life. They're tried and tested. Everybody knows how to use a mobile phone. The second part was we had a learning management system. So we have a learning management system that has been used for the last 15 years. And as part of that learning system, every country in the world has representatives from the defense side and non-government organizations or NGOs that have access to this portal. So we have two, two technologies that are state of the art, or should I say two technologies that are operational. So what we've done is we're saying, okay, let's merge these two together. And that's what we're calling developing the system of systems. So what we're trying to do is this project is to test two operational capabilities, put them together, and see if it really works. So that's really what the project was really all about. Managing expectations. Well, you can see there's quite a few there. We have 24 nations involved in this concept. We had selected the medical field uh, as the proof, the demonstration, and that was really interesting because when we started the project and we rolled out the, the vision of the video, the vision of the video has a lot to do with disaster preparedness, uh, emergency conditions, and immediately after we rolled out the project, one of our partners is Chile, and that's when they had the earthquake in Chile. And so it kind of it kind of brought to home the fact of the utility of why you need this type of capability. So for this project, we have the 24 nations. 
And each one of these nations has two types of representatives. They have a medical representative and they have an e-learning representative. So you can imagine they both have their different goals and objectives. You have the e-learning representative that he's interested in learning how to take this capability and put it in his learning platform to support the military or the defense agencies or the non-government agencies in his country. At the same time, you have the medical doctors that now looking at how can they use this capability to support when they have to go to disasters or to support their own country when crises occur. So they both have different ideas. But then again, there's the third type of idea is that you have some people on this project from the government side who kind of had their own ideas on what they wanted to be in this project. So needless to say, it was, it was quite a mix of everybody kind of having their idea. And of course, my job was to kind of rein in everyone and to get the headaches and to make sure that everybody kind of get on the same sheet. Okay. So the first thing we did, we talked about was the proof of concept. Remember, we're testing a concept. We're testing mobile technologies. We're not testing learning. We're not, we're not going to evaluate the learner. We're not going to evaluate if the learner learns from the, from the course because the basis from which we developed this concept was that the courses are being provided by subject matter experts, so the content that they are providing is valid. We're not questioning the content. So the object was then to assess the technology to see if it will actually meet the need. Okay. So the first critical part is that the fact that we are involving human beings, which you'll hear me talk about in a minute, there has to be some significant, there has to be a way of them to sign on and to remain anonymous. Because when you're doing testing, you need to make sure that the individual that you're collecting information on does not contain any identifiable characteristics, but the fact is that they are assigned a number. The goal of this project was to assess the technology all around the world, okay? So in this case, all of these countries will be identifying at least 15 persons for each representative. So there'll be 30 people who are gonna participate in this proof of concept. So they will send me, their, their delegate from their country will send me their email address. I will take that email address and I will give them their own pass number or pass ID, user ID. Then afterwards they have to sign the consent form acknowledging they accept to play by the rules of the proof of concept. And we'll talk about this in a minute, which is very critical when you talk about developing new technology. Okay, because you have to make sure that the human research protection is provided. And that's what's critical here. All right. So then each, we're assigned a scenario. You heard me talk about getting ready in the air or in route or on the ground. And through the whole process, there's being some transparency data that's being collected. And there's some actually survey questionnaires. So the focus of the project to understand what the usability, the utility, and the suitability of this concept as a mobile device. The next part is you want to understand their comfort level. What is their self-efficacy? Are, are they comfortable enough with using the technology? So that's why we're actually collecting a lot of transparency data. The transparency data doesn't tell us who the individual is. It just tells us when they're using the app and they go from one place to another, how comfortable are they with the technology? Because if you're going to make an assessment, you need to make sure the data is valid. So based on that, we go all the way through. So we're, we're, we're realistic scenarios. We're pretending it's a hazardous situation. We're checking the SIM. We're collecting both qualitative and quantitative data. And we're making sure that we have an understanding of what the user thinks about the capability. Now, this is the interesting one. I remember I was talking to one of my, the contractors on this, and I said the word color of money. He said, I thought money was all one color. Well, it's not. Color has, money has different colors when you talk about businesses and you talk about government organizations. So I'll talk about that. Protection of individuals is important and informed consent. During this project, the fact that it was paid for by research funding, which is one of the colors of money, you have to make sure that the rules of due diligence are provided. The EU has very strict guidelines on when you're collecting individuals, collecting data from individuals. 
I didn't say own individuals, I said from individuals. Okay? Most of that information is maintained in the framework seven because that's research. So if you go to the framework program, there is a lot of information there about how to collect informed consent. In fact, it's actually identified in the EU as the data protection requirements guidelines. The fact that we are dealing with Ministry of Defense in the UK, there is a research ethics requirement that has to be met. So if you're collecting data from anyone in the military, you have to meet research ethic requirements. And in the US, we have two of them. One is called the common rule, and the other one is called the requirements for, for US funded research and the protection of human vigil, individuals, okay? So when you're putting together a project that relates to funding like that, you have to cover all aspects. So this is it, the color of money. In, every, in most organizations, there are two types of money. There is the one that's called operation and maintenance, which I put in this box. And this is the type of money that pays your salary, it pays for your organization, it pays your electric bill, your gas bill, your computers, how people work, pays your vacation maybe. But it's the day-to-day -day money operations that a government or a corporate organizations use, as well as government organizations. But then there's this other inner box, which is critical. And this box relates to the different color of money, because when you talk about research funding, which is different, you have different categories. You have the basic, the applied, the advanced technology, as in the case what we're doing here, a proof of concept, and you're doing the acquisition and deployment. Once you have finished this last phase of, of research, then it actually goes into the O&M box, okay? Because the technology has been developed, it's been tested, that's why you have Microsoft computers, that's why you have the different things in your learning system, management learning systems, okay? Now, from a, from a perspective, in the OM and N, you do surveys, you may do questionnaires, you may want, your boss may ask you to find out what's the next best thing, so you might even do internet research, you might read academic articles, look at technical reviews or, or peer reviews, okay? But in the o and side, you cover that, but I want you to think about something for a minute. In essence, that is research. Okay? It's not paid for with research money, but it is research. When you get to the basic research and apply, these, you, you do the same thing, but you don't take it to the next step. Whereas when you do technology development, okay, here's where you're getting into surveys, questions, usability testing, proofs of concept, or operational demonstrations. So what you're actually doing here is you're checking a new capability, as I said, putting together the systems of systems, to find out if it works, okay? And to find out if it works, you have to ask somebody, okay? Someone who's gonna be using the technology, okay? <laughs> So when you're doing this, there, these are the main three things you have to cover. You have to make sure that the privacy of the individual is maintained. There is no personal data that can identify that person or any characteristic to identify that person. And you have to make sure that if they are identified or anything, they have to be, make sure they're protected whether by parents, physiological, cultural, or social identity. This is an eye chart, but it's just an example of two of the three pages that had to be developed to meet the US, EU, and the UK requirements. It is an informed consent that each one needs to do. And it's called a research protocol. So when you're doing research, you have to, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you're the quality director of a company or you're in training and you want to ask somebody what they think about this new course that you provided, you know, you should follow what, what in the quality world they call best practices. So you're gonna ask them, you're gonna give them an introduction on why you're conducting the research, why you're doing the survey, what's the purpose of it. Sometimes you might wanna put how long it's gonna take for them to fill it out. Then you're gonna give them a voluntary, you should give them a voluntary participation or withdrawal Confidentiality should be there. You should give them the option to let them know, do not put your name on it so that you'll be protected and things like that, okay? But when you're doing basic research with research money, the other color of money, then it has to cover all of these, okay? As in the case of the mobile learning environment project, what we're actually doing is that when each individual gets to download their app, there's two things they have to do. One is they have to put in their alphanumeric number, and the last thing they have to do is they have to do a tick box that says that they voluntarily agreed to do this. 
okay? That way we have this, we have it listed and we have, if you're doing it in person, as in the case of a usability study, you need to get their action signature by hand, okay? The things I would like to leave with you is like twofold. One is that whenever you develop a project, make sure you understand what the expectations are and what you really want to come with. And the second one is, when someone comes to you to the table, they're going to have all these great ideas of how they can use your technology, all these great ideas that can make this project work. I would ask you to make sure you do one thing. Walk before you run. Thank you.